Ah, hello all. How's it going? Ah, it's been, uh, it's been, a, it feels like it's been a while since our last stream. It's only been two days, but I've been, uh, I've been wanting to get back into it. So, hello everybody. Good to be back. Uh, I'm your boy, Rizzy Orenji, and today, uh, well, I mean, I suppose I don't want to get right into it. How's everybody doing? Yeah, if there's anybody here in the, let's, uh, check. Hello, everybody. <laughs> I, uh, how, how's everybody doing, you know? I've been doing pretty well, uh, Nintendo's Direct yesterday was, it sure was something, man. I, I'm so excited for Metroid Dread. I'm going, I'm definitely going to be playing that game on stream when it comes out, so look forward to that. I, I am a sucker for two, 2.5D Metroidvanias, and... Oh my god, I, I can't believe Nintendo actually put out another 2D Metroid while they were working on Prime 4. That's insane. Ah, I'm so happy. Uh, and, you know, there are also some other cool announcements. I think they had Breath of the Wild 2 news. That game looks... That game's looking pretty good, I think. Uh, Mario Superstars, I guess, if you're super into uh, the old Mario Party games. Uh, Oh yeah, that's right. Kazuya uh, uh, from Tekken got into Smash Bros. too. That's pretty cool. I've never played a, I've never really played a Tekken game, but I liked Terry when he came out for DLC, and I never played any of the Fatal Fury games. I don't know. I think it's something about like adapting the, the mechanics of a, a different fighting game into Smash Bros. that uh, I guess really makes those sorts of fighting characters stand out. So. I'm excited for Kasia. I mean, it's not who I would have wanted by a long shot, but, you know, I, I, I will reserve my judgment until I actually play him. Ah. But anyways, uh, enough video game talk. We're here for some music reviews. And what is the topic today? Uh, it is progressive rock band King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard. No, not that. That's, that's a different band, sorry. Uh, King Crimson, progressive rock band King Crimson. Ah, uh, they, uh, so who are they? If you've only ever heard of King Crimson from the JoJo uh, stands, or, you know, if you've, ever, if you've just heard the name, you haven't really listened to the music, uh, who are they? They are a progressive rock band that was founded back in 1968, uh, back in London, England. And uh, for the past 53 years or so, uh, they've been around in multiple different incarnations. Uh, and they've had many talented, creative musicians go through the ranks who would later go, who may have later gone on to play in other bands or done their own solo, cool, experimental stuff. Um, but the one who figures the heaviest in King Crimson history is the uh, founding guitarist Robert Fripp. He's been the sole original member of the band uh, for the past 53 years, and he's essentially been their creative voice. Uh, and, and as great as the other members' contributions to the band have been, uh, the band essentially lives and dies with him. So that's gonna be a recurring theme as we go through the uh, reviews, so keep that in mind. Um, so, you might, be re you might be wondering how I'm going to do this tier ranking. Uh, well, actually, let's go to the, uh, let's go to the tier screen first. Zoop. Okay, so, you'll notice here I've got, you know, simple tier list from S to D. Uh, I don't really have any objective measure for how I rank these. I'm only ranking them in relation to uh, the King Crimson discography. I don't have like any objective measure of what makes an S, what makes an A, what makes a B, etc., etc. Uh, I'm only doing this uh, in relation to. Uh, I'm only ranking these albums really in relation to one another. Um, so with that being said. I think we can actually get to, uh, I think we can actually start, uh, so, let's go. What is the first King Crimson album? It is In the Court of the Crimson King, and I guess I should start things off right away by, uh, putting this up here. Yeah, um, this album 
If you've never listened to out this album, uh, go listen to it. It is essential listening. It is essential. It is essential progressive rock. It's the album that invented it, pretty much. You know, what hasn't been said about this album, including what hasn't been said about this album. Uh, the original lineup behind this album, including Fripp and uh, Greg Lake on bass and vocals, uh, Ian McDonald on woodwind keys and sax, and Michael Giles on drums, who, by the way, is a beast of a drummer who never really did anything after King Crimson. Um, but he was a huge inspiration on uh, like Neil Peart's drumming, so just in the drumming alone, this album had a major influence in progressive rock. Um, and then there was uh, Peter Sinfield, who was the uh, primary lyricist of the band, and he also did uh, the band's uh, stage lighting. I don't know, it's, he's one of those uh, weird band members who's, who doesn't really make the music, but he's still like an important creative voice. Um, his name will come up a few more times, but uh, he essentially was the guiding voice in the first few years of the band. Um, what else? And, okay, so to talk about this band, they, their chemistry was freaking amazing. Even on the studio album, even just listening to these studio recordings, you can hear, like, 21st Century Schizoid Man, the lead-off track of this album. It's pretty much the earliest building blocks of pro progressive metal. You've got Greg Lake uh, screaming through dis distorted vocals about the Vietnam War, you know, Cat C, Blind Man's Greed, all that stuff. Uh, you got Michael Giles playing this frantic, superb jazz fusion drumming inspired part. Uh, Robert Fripp dueling with Ian McDonald's sax during the solo section. And of course, you know, you've got that iconic riff, that ascending ba 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 ba, that, that sort of thing. <sighs> it's, it's just a freaking classic song. If you only know that song through, like, the Kanye West sample, for instance, or if you've heard like a few seconds of it, do yourself a favor and go listen to that because it's it's such an invigorating, exhilarating song. Even 53 years, at, even 52 years after it came out, um, then you then you follow that up with on the album with a uh, I Talk to the Wind, which is this sweet ballad with soft harmonies, acoustic guitars, this gorgeous flute part, and you got this drumming by Michael Giles that makes it sound like the song is floating on a breeze, like it's a very, it's very groovy, but it's very jazzy at the same time, and it's, it's, it was a really sweet tune, very underrated in comparison with the rest of the tracks on this album, I'd say. Uh, what else have we got? Uh, there's Epitaph, oh my gosh, Epitaph is a powerhouse of a song. Uh, Greg Lake, he absolutely nails the vocals on this song. He, he's singing these lyrics, uh, you know, about feeling the apocalypse at hand, and he, he gives the added gravitas that this song needs. And then, of course, you've got uh, this gorgeous accompaniment in, in the background of Mellotron, which is essentially this uh, synthesizer that sounds like an orchestra, like a string orchestra. Uh, you've got all these acoustic guitars and this steady backbeat by Michael Giles. And then there's this beautiful, like, little instrumental interlude. I think it's called the March for No Reason. And, and it just adds to, like, the haunting, like, weighty atmosphere of this song. It's a really, uh, I, guess, I guess it's a song of its time. Uh, a brilliant, it, it echoes the zeitgeist of the 60s perfectly. Um, then we move on to side B of Court of the Crimson King, and it starts off with this uh, track uh, called Moonchild, and it can be a bit of a confusing listen for first-time listeners, because the first part, the dream, it's, it's innocent enough. It's a sweet little ballad with guitar and a pretty flute part, but then it gets into the illusion, which is uh, pretty much just free jazz. Um, even if you listen to this part, but it, uh, I find, I find if you listen to this part with good headphones, the sonic textures explored, while they are pretty dense and they might be a little alienating to people who don't really like improvisational music, it's, you know, it's really mind-bending in parts. You know, sit down, maybe have a little catnip, listen to this song. It, it's really, it, it's really a trip. 
And then there's a, a great payoff at the end where it's like the sweetest guitar part that Robert Fripp has ever laid down. It's very pretty, very soft, very nice ending to the song. And then of course, you cap this album off with the classic In the Court of the Crimson King, which has this iconic, epic, sweeping Mellotron riff, backed by bass and drums that, you know, sound straight out of some sort of psychedelic rock song. Um, of course, you've got the classical blend too, with Ian McDonald's flutes, and oh my god, there's, there's this false ending in the song, where you think it ends, and then Ian McDonald's flutes come in, and then the full band crashes in, and just, oh my god, classic progressive rock. This, this, this entire album is just a classic. Ugh. So overall, what can I say? It, it established this album, In the Court of the Crimson King, it establishes uh, the standard for King Crimson albums going forward. It, it's got this complexity bounced with emotive expression, bounced with uh, this tendency to explore multiple different sonic textures in a single album. So yeah, S rank, go listen to it. Essential, essential music. Uh, give me one second. Just gonna get a sip. Okay, continuing onward, uh, so, question for you guys, how do you follow up the most influential progressive rock album of all time? Why, you implode and you try it again, of course. Well, that's not how I would do it, but that's how King Crimson did it. Uh, after King Crimson's first US tour, you see, uh, the band experienced its first major lineup shift. Uh, Ian, McDonald's, uh, Ian McDonald and Michael Giles left because they felt uh, King Crimson was going in a bit of a dark direction and they wanted to explore the softer sounds that you hear on like I Talk to the Wind and Court of the Crimson King. Um, and then Lake left to go be the bassist, the vocalist, and the Lake of Emerson, Lake, and Palmer. Um, so this essentially left Fripp and Sinfield behind to pick up the pieces and strike while the iron was hot, while uh, they had this album in the Court of the Crimson King, this wildly successful album on their hands. So they needed to follow it up, and they needed to follow it up quick. Um, so what did they do? Uh, well, the album actually features uh, Greg Lake and Michael Guile still, but they've come back as session musicians, essentially. Greg Lake sings uh, vocals on most tracks on the most vocal tracks on the album, and uh, Mike Gu Michael Giles is again the drummer, and he delivers a superb performance. And there's also a, a bunch of other studio musicians too: uh, jazz pianist Keith Tippett, uh, future King Crimson player actually Mel Crimson made uh, <laughs> Mel Collins. Not Mel Crimson. Mel Collins made his debut on this album. He plays flute, he plays sax. He, he essentially takes up Ian McDonald's role. Um, but this album, uh, In the Wake of Poseidon, it's essentially what I would call a doppelganger album. Uh, it, that is to say, uh, it's an album that was created hot off, of, hot off the heels of a successful album. Uh, in an attempt to essentially recapture that album's lightning in a bottle and recreate what made the original so good. Uh, sometimes uh, this works. Uh, you've got a bunch of great albums out there, like Van Halen 2 was essentially the same album as Van Halen 1, but it's still, it's still freaking awesome. Um, but then other times it's, it's lackluster. And uh, in, in King Crimson's case, fortunately they mostly succeeded. I'd say uh, Pictures of a City, it's a great dark jazzy jam in the vein of 21st century schizoid man. Uh, the title track recaptures the apocalyptic grandeur of Epitaph with Greg Lake again delivering a killer vocal performance. Uh, Cadence and Cascade is a lovely ballad in the vein of I Talk to the Wind. And it features uh, the vocalist Greg Haskell for the first time. He he gives this sweet vocal delivery on top of it. Uh, and remember that name. We're gonna come back to him soon. Um, then you've got the Devil's Triangle, which is it, it's essentially um, it's the moonchild of this album. It's a, a little recreation of. 
uh, I guess Gustav Holst, Holst's War composition. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with classical music, but they, King Crimson certainly were, were and they took inspiration from Gustav Holst for this track. And in the last few minutes, it just descends into sonic chaos. It's like Moonchild turned up to 11. It even samples um, in the court of the Crimson King <laughs> briefly. Um, unfortunately, there is no uh, in the court of the Crimson King analog on this album. There is cat food. <laughs> uh, cat food. It's. Uh, it's clear that that song was the album's single song, and man, it is it, it is really weird. Uh, Lake's got this really commanding vocal part, and Keith Tippett delivers. It, he, he has a really interesting piano part. It's like it sounds like a cat walking around on a bunch of uh, on, on a bunch of piano keys. Um, but I don't know personally, Cat Food. It it's a nice listen, but it's not a King Crimson track that I would come back to. Um, there's also this recurring suite of songs throughout the album called Peace. Uh, it starts off as this a cappella vocal track at the beginning of the album called A Beginning. Uh, it gets played as a guitar lick in a theme, and then it presents the full melody with guitar and vocals on the uh, closing track called An End. Uh, and the suite's pretty, sure. I like it just well enough. But it almost feels like a bit of an afterthought, given the track length and, uh, the track lengths for each of the songs. And the lyrics, they feel like something almost, uh, like, yes-like. They sound like something yes would write. Not really, uh, King Crimson topical matter, but I don't know. Um, overall, uh, the album is good. If you, if you like their debut, you'll probably like this one, uh, but since it's more of the same but a bit less focused, I think I am going to give this album a B. Uh, let me just pop that up right here. Okay. Um, so next up, uh, we got their follow-up album, Lizard. They still, King Crimson still didn't really have a stable band lineup at this point. Um, what they did have was, uh, hold on a second. What they did have, they had Greg Haskell, they had Mel Collins, and they brought on this drummer called Andy McCulloch, and then they tried to make a third studio album called Lizard. Uh, and I'm just gonna say this now, this album is baffling as hell, uh, and if you can believe it, it's probably their most experimental work, uh, so far that they've released at this point. Uh, it takes more of a chamber jazz meets Renfair sort of approach to its sound, and in some cases, it works. In other cases, oh, oh, oh boy, where do I start? Um, so Gordon Haskell, right, he plays the bass and he sings on this album. Uh, he was a friend of Robert, Robert Fripps, who was called on to sing for King Crimson. He'd actually played with Fripp a bit in the 60s, and that's how he got the gig. Uh, and I should say that right now, that he's not a bad singer. He, he nailed Cadence and Cascade on In the Wake of Poseidon, and he's got a track on here, uh, Lady of the Dancing Water, where he really shines on. It's like this lovely track with guitar and flute. It's, it's, it's a highlight of this album, I think. But it's obvious that uh, Haskell's heart wasn't with progressive rock. In fact, he admitted to it that as much years later, after the fact. He was more of a Motown soul guy. Um, he's just sort of there for most of the album. And uh, Happy Family, oh, it makes it even worse by just distorting his vocals and panning them all over the place. I actually think that was a complaint of his. Like, he was worried that this album would sort of ruin his reputation because his voice was all processed and stuff. So, uh, I hear you, Haskell. I hear you. Um, the textures on this album, other than that, they're, they're too cluttered and unfocused most of the time for me to really derive much enjoyment from them. Uh, Circus is fine enough because it builds from this gradual soft harpsichord into a haunting sax led march, but then you got indoor games and happy family, and they just sort of meander, and with all the keys and woodwind overdubs, uh, they sound more like stuff written by Chicago. Uh, early Chicago, I mean, which is, which, it's not a bad thing, but if I wanted to listen to Chicago, I'd listen to Chicago, so 
I generally avoid listening to these songs. Uh, the centerpiece of the album and uh, is arguably its a 23 minute title track, uh, which depicts both musically and lyrically the, uh, the before and after of a battle. Uh, there are neat moments. Uh, you've got John Anderson, actually, from Yes, who was brought on to sing the first part because Greg Haskell didn't really have it in his range or uh, tone. And it's neat. It's kind of like an alternative universe, like what if uh, John Anderson had joined King Crimson? Um, actually, funny story, Elton John at one point was considered to sing for the album, but uh, uh, I think it was Robert Fripp listened to his debut and he was like, Nah, let this guy develop on his own for a bit, and, well, uh, I guess he sort of missed that boat. Um, what else? Uh, there's, a uh, oh yeah, the entire Battle of Glass Tear Suite is pretty cool, too. It's, like, really good interplay between guitar, bass, and drums. But, how to say, uh, there's also a lot of filler in, in this giant track, you know? You've got the extended bolero section, which is essentially just an extended classical inspired march played straight which i don't have a problem with but i don't know i prefer more variety more fusion in my king crimson uh it's okay so wizard is not really a bad album it can be a very alienating listen though and exhausting if you go into it right after the first two so i would say proceed with caution don't sleep on it but do proceed with caution. Uh, I'm going to give it a C. So, uh, give me a sec. I'm gonna get me some water real quick. All right. So then what happened after Lizard? Well, Gordon Haskell and Andy McCulloch would leave the band acrimoniously because of artistic differences, and that left Fripp and Sinfield, once again, to pick up the pieces. Uh, they brought on two unknowns in Boz Burrell on vocals and bass. Uh, fun fact, Boz would later go on to play bass for Bad Company, um, and Ian Wallace on the drums. Uh, so what did they do with this new lineup? Why, of course, they recorded another studio album. <laughs> and this album is called Islands. Uh, now, Islands, um, I think that it learns from the mistakes of the previous album. Uh, the band explores, it still explores these unique sonic textures reminiscent of folky pastoral vibes, but they do so in a way which gives the listener room to breathe and the band members room to express themselves. Uh, Formentera Lady, the lead-off track, it's, it's really neat. It goes from this duet between Boz Burrell and a double bass, to a folksy section with light, a light, airy feeling, to this layering chaos of instruments surrounding uh, Mel Collins' extended sax solo. It's a really engaging listen for 10 minutes of essentially like light-hearted pastoral stuff. I, I really enjoy it. Um, and then even the darker, heavier tracks of this album, like Sailor's Tale, The Letters, Ladies of the Road, they have this intensity and chemistry to them which hasn't been seen in the band since their debut. A lot, a lot of striking standout moments. Uh, there's the shift in tempo and the, the guitar and the dueling leads of the guitar and the sax in Sailor's Tale. There's the freakout leading into the final verse and the letters. There's Mel Collins' dirty sax solo and Ladies of the Road. So, so, so many great moments. Um, but the title track is the most, is probably the most beautiful thing King Crimson has ever recorded. It mostly features this immaculate piano work from Keith Tippett again, coming back as a studio musician as well as an emotional cornet solo from Mark Cherig and a heartfelt vocal from Boz Burrell, singing some of Peter Sinfield's most, I guess, somber lyrics ever. Uh, the latter half is the band, they, they gradually come in, they show their masterful restraint, building a grand, almost near symphonic background to Cherig's hopeful sounding cornet. It's very post-rock, like, I, I feel like a lot of post-rock bands, uh, Took, listen, took note of islands. Um, and it, it's, I don't know, the result is something that's truly stunning. Definitely, Islands is a highlight track on this album. 
The one mark I would say against Islands as an album, though, is the classical composition, uh, Prelude Song of the Goals. And I mean, classical, uh, and I mean, it is a classical composition. It's a, essentially a string quartet with a flute over top, and it's fine, I guess. Uh, you know, I like classical music, I have nothing against it. But, you know, much like the piece suite on In the Wake of Poseidon, uh, this track is not the first thing I would think of if I wanted to recommend somebody King Crimson. Um, so all in all, this album, uh, Islands, is an underrated gem. Uh, all music actually calls it the weakest of King Crimson's early period, but <laughs> whoever wrote that, in my opinion, either must have been super into Lizard or was on Catnip, because holy damn do I love this album. I'm going to give it an A. Give me one second. Uh, yeah, I'm giving it an A. You know, it's not an album on the level of In the Court of the Crimson King, I'd say, but it's a damn good one nevertheless, and one where I think that the band finally regained its footing. Or did they? <laughs> Actually, the Islands Band. They went on to go tour and promote the album, but uh, Fripp quickly became tired of his bandmates' uh, rock and roll, drugs, and party lifestyle, and his bandmates became uh, fed up with his control freak nature. So uh, the, band, uh, the band essentially broke up at the end of 1971 and Fripp dismissed Sinfield. Uh, but then, uh, what was it, the band came back briefly in 1972 to, to finish a few more tour dates. But Fripp, he essentially decided to create an entirely new Crimson lineup and he, and he dismissed the Islands band after that tour. Uh, he was getting more inspired at the time by free improvisation and Eastern European classical music, so then he recruited a new band which included bassist and vocalist John Wetton, percussionist and general wild man uh, Dave Muir, uh, violinist Dave Cross, and former Yes drummer Bill Bruford, who, full disclosure, is one of my favorite drummers of all time. So. Uh, after a few months of touring, uh, the band was generally sort of feeling it out, uh, getting a feel for their sounds, uh, they decided to put together the next King Crimson album, uh, Lark's Tongues and Aspic. Um, and in hindsight, uh, this album is a, is, a hell of a, is a hell of a stylistic shift, this one. Um, so through this album and the next few albums to come, uh, it continued the crimson. It, it, it continued the crimson tradition of fusing all sorts of different sonic textures, uh, but these textures increasingly trended towards the more abrasive. Uh, think more 21st century schizoid man, and less in the court of the crimson king. It's here essentially where we see the beginnings of progressive metal. Um, it's born from the intensity of the band's studio and live jams or, as Fripp would call them, blows. Um, it's a bit of an odd term, but uh, it's, it's a bit of a Frippism. Um, what else? Um, so as a result of the more improvisatory focus of this lineup, uh, we start to see a lot more instrumentals show up on King Crimson albums. Half of Lark's Tongues and Aspects tracks are instrumentals. Um, definitely more than half of its runtime is instrumental. Um, talking drum, it's, it's essentially just like a bongo driven jam in 4 4, but it's an, it's an exercise in tension and it's really interesting. The band it basically builds from this quiet stampede, rumbling in the distance, to a roaring charge until it's all broken suddenly by this shrill horn sound. Um, and then there's the two Lark's Tongues and Aspects songs, part one and part two. Uh, the first part is this 13 minute epic with multiple different sections. It's got this peaceful quasi Southeast Asian percussion melody to the band's full entry harkened by Robert Fripp's uh, crushing guitar riffs um, uh, to an extended violin condenser by Cross. And it's all connected by this uh, driving motivic riff that riff that phrase uh, that Fripp plays throughout the song. Um, the second part, Lark's Tongues and Aspect Part 2, it's more compact and it's a heavier song. It builds on the motivic riff from the first part, 
with a more badass mid-tempo groove supplied by the rhythm section. Seriously, I cannot emphasize enough. This is probably the best rhythm section, section King Crimson has ever had. Uh, John Wetton and Bill Bruford, they go ham. And I do, not, I do not mean that compliment lightly. King Crimson has had so many killer rhythm sections, as we'll see. Um, but it's uh, but essentially Lark's Tongue and Aspect Part 2. It's like a heavy metal version of Igor Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring. Uh, and if you need any proof of this album's impact on progressive rock or progressive metal in general, uh, Dream Theater in 2008, 2009, around that time, they covered uh, Lark's Tongue and Aspect Part 2 basically note for note, leaving it unchanged. So. Uh, King Crimson essentially invented prog metal with this album. <laughs> uh, despite the instrumental focus, though, there are actually there are three actual song songs. Uh, they're sung by John Wetton, and but the lyrics were written by this guy named uh, Richard Palmer James. Uh, by far the best vocal track on this song is the ballad Exiles, which brings back uh, the Mellotron from early King Crimson albums and it pairs its chords beautifully with this uh, violin melody by David, David Cross. It alternates between these uh, sweet sections and these menacing sounds of the reverse uh, distorted electric guitar or synth or violin. I can't really tell what it is, but it's haunting nonetheless, and it's, it's such a great track. It's such a sound, standout track. There's another ballad too called The Book of Saturday, but at just under three minutes, it doesn't really last long enough, in my opinion, to leave uh, a, 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 like a lasting impression. Uh, then there's Easy Money, which is essentially the best song about prostitution written by a progressive rock band, This Side of Young Lust. Uh, the groove in this song is so chill, and the vocals, guitar, and drums seem to dance with each other in the, in the, vo in the verses. It's like they're, they're playing all these different time signatures at once, and it's really crazy shit. Um, and then they all join together for this heavy chorus drop, you know, EASY MONEY! Oh, sorry, I did no justice there, but you know what it means, it hits hard. Um, and it's also where I'd say the two drummers shine the most. This was the first time that King Crimson had, like, uh, a more than one drummer in his lineup, and it was super effective here, on this track especially. Uh, Bill Bruford, he lays down this steady backbeat, while David Muir, meanwhile, is in the background playing with all these percussions and, as he called them, all sorts, which was just essentially a bunch of random items. He even had, like, a laughing kid's toy uh, to play that sound effect at the end of the song. Uh, hey, Cosmic Catwalk, what's up? <sighs> oh dear, uh... <laughs> Hold on a sec, let me see your comments. Oh dear, I'm half an hour two prog song lengths late. <laughs> Best song about prostitution. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, yes. Uh, I can't say uh, I, I know many others off of the top of my head, but uh, freaking uh, Easy Money, great song, listen to it, it's sexy as hell. Uh, for, for a band uh, as mechanical as King Crimson, that is. <laughs> um, what else? Um, but yeah, uh, overall, I'd say Lars Tongues and Aspic, uh, it's a very, uh, it's a very stellar outing for the first incarnation of this free, improv pr uh, free improvisation King Crimson lineup. I'm gonna give it an A. Um, how to say? It's, it's stellar, but it's a little undercooked, I think. Um, so moving on, uh, after Larks, it seemed as though King Crimson were hitting a new stride, essentially. And then David Muir just left to become a monk, randomly. <laughs> so, um, so what did they do? Uh, they carried on as a quartet, they heavily toured from 1973 through 74, um, there are some pretty stellar performances from this time. In fact, I heavily recommend, if you like this era of the band, go and listen to the live album The Night Watch. It is, it is some electrifying chemistry on display, especially the live version of 21st Century Schizoid Man there. Oh my god, that is, that's probably the best take of that song outside of the studio version. Um, but I, I digress. Um, 
there, yeah, there are some stellar performances from this period, and they and they blended like performances of King Crimson songs just as is with random improvisations, which again uh, Robert Fripp referred to as blows. Um, but that said, all of this heavy touring left the band le uh, with little new material to really make an album with. So what did they do? They uh, took soundboard recordings from the tour, uh, especially of the improv songs, and they added to them and they polished to them in the studio uh, with new recordings, and they called them new songs. Uh, you've got <laughs> It's Easy As Pie. Uh, a prog fan could probably live their life on just live bootlegs alone. Oh my god. <laughs> No, actually, uh, to digress a little more, uh, King Crimson, uh, there's a reason I'm not discussing live albums in this tier ranking, because King Crimson, not only have they had, like, a number of official live releases, but they've, like, they've essentially put out most, like, bootleg or, like, ofi like official soundboard recordings from their live shows in the past 50-so years, so if I were to include live albums in this list, we would be here for, like, a fucking day. No, no cap. Um, what else? Uh... So yeah, um, yeah, well, essentially what they did for Starless and Bible Black, this new album, yeah, they took live soundboard recordings and they polished them up with uh, new studio recordings. Bam, easy new songs, right? Uh, well, not so much. You see, two of the songs were actually recorded entirely in the studio. Uh, the, vast the vast majority are pulled from the live shows. Uh, the two, the suit, oh, sorry. The two songs that were recorded in the studio, actually, uh, they were um, the lead-up songs. They were The Great Deceiver and Lament. They're excellent showcases, I would say, of the band's song-making chops, especially the former. The Great Deceiver is like a, a banger of an opening. Like, it really opens the album with a bang. Um, but... <sighs> Uh, if, I, if I had to address one thing, it's that uh, it might be a little jarring for first-time listeners hearing the first line of the song uh, where, uh, where John Wetton literally says, Health food, uh, f six-letter F-word that is a homophobic slur. And yes, King Crimson Circle Jerk, r slash King Crimson Circle Jerk, before you jump down my throat, I know that it was, I know that it was meant as either meatball or skinny guy or however they thought it was at the time, but uh, the lyricist Richard Palmer James later regretted that he didn't think of the homophobic implications of that word, and so ha, I have grounds to complain about this. Uh, nothing makes you, sorry. Nothing makes you stutter like having to read prog band names and song titles. Fucking truth. Oh my god. This is gonna be even worse when I fucking review yes. Um, what else? Uh, oh yeah, Lament, the other track, the other studio recorded track. It's a great song. It hits at the greed of the recording industry, which is a chip that Robert Fripp has always sort of had on his shoulder. Uh, when, Crim when King Crimson actually first broke up, this is getting a bit ahead of things, but when King Crimson first broke up in 1974, they were essentially $125,000 in debt because their recording, the record label, I think, were shit with getting the royalties to them. So, but that, that's a digression. Um, but as I said, as I was saying, Lament, it's this really, it's, it's this really cool song. It goes through a bunch of different sections, from the soft intro to a more hard-hitting section with hand claps and bass, uh, and then it's sort of, uh, my one complaint I would say, it's sort of a bend, it, it sort of ends a bit abruptly. Um, but then, then after those, those, after those songs, we start getting into the live recorded material and, uh, well, it's hit and miss. On the one hand, you've got pieces like Trio and The Night Watch, which showcase the band as pros of like chordal and melodic organization, especially Trio. Uh, it's this sweet guitar, this sweet live guitar, bass, and violin moment that's, that's, that's so good that, you know, Bill Bruford, the drummer, he was given uh, songwriting credits for the song for not playing, for literally letting them just vibe. Uh, 
Unfortunately, it's 2021, and record labels haven't improved that much. <laughs> yeah, truth. Freaking truth. Uh, you, you can't you can't get away with playing this sort of music on a major label anymore, I don't think. Uh, what else? Uh... Oh yeah. So the rest, uh, other than Trio and the Night Watch, I would say that the rest of the improvisatory material, it sort of meanders. And while there are some generally cool band jam moments on the title track, Starless and Bible Black, it takes a few minutes of tension to really get going. And, um, you know, after all the minutes before of other uh, live improvisatory material, it's just sort of exhausting. Uh, Fracture, however, Fracture, the closing song, I think deserves special mention. It's not quite improvised. In fact, it's it's got uh, these distinct sections that sort of develop around Robert Fripp's dissonant guitar riffs. It's a damn powerhouse of a piece, I think. It has this soft section with Fripp playing quickly like a banjo over all these distorted notes, over a tense groove and eerie violin playing, uh, to this recurring heavy riff reminiscent of Black Sabbath. Uh, to this end part where Fripp and Cross are continually, you know, ratcheting up the tempo like da 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 da, while while Wetton and Bruford are just chasing after them, and it's really exciting. Uh, it's definitely the instrumental highlight of the album, I would say. Uh, Tool are still popular, but even then, they only release an album when the blood moon rises and New Year's fall upon the earth. Oh Jesus, yeah. They're, uh, they're, they're like the Metroid series in that regard, aren't they? <laughs> hey yo, uh, what else? Oh yeah, um, so that's essentially my opinion of the album. It's essential. it's not bad, per se, but if you're not used to improvisational music, it can be a challenging listen. You know, the band, I think, personally, they were firing on all cylinders at this point, but it is a very uh, isolating listen, so I think what I'm going to do... Hold on a sec. Uh, I am going to put this album in the C tier. Um, uh, the, the albums, I would say, bookending it. Uh, Lark's Tongue and Aspect, and the next album we're going to get into, Red. Uh, they were both more cohesive and comprehensible by comparison. Uh, Definitely don't sleep on Starless and Bible Black, but don't make it your first King Crimson album. Uh, looking forward to the new 2D album this year, the new 2D Tool album this year. Uh, what else? So, um... Oh yeah, um, before we move on though from Starless and Bible Black, a little fun fact. Uh, if this album's title sounds familiar at all, that's because it would later be the namesake for the era gay Bible Black. Turns out that the creator of that era gay, Say Shoujo, was a huge fan of King Crimson, so that means you've got King Crimson in part to thank for anime witch titties. Anyway, moving on. After Starless and Bible Black, the King Crimson Wartet, uh, buff. The King Crimson Quartet toured for a bit longer before things started to come apart. By summer 1974, uh, Cross was kicked out of the band because of musical differences. Really, it was becoming increasingly hard for him to be heard over the power of Bruford and Wetton's rhythm section. Uh, what uh, Robert Flip, uh, sorry, Robert Flip, Robert Fripp would later refer to the two of them as a flying brick wall. Uh, Fripp himself was actually having doubts about uh, his role in the band and the music industry and stuff, and he was having a bit of a spiritual exploration at the time, so uh, when they were going to record their next album, he was a little checked out artistically. Um, but what else? Um, so essentially, under these circumstances, uh, the remaining trio of Bruford, Fripp, Wetton, they get together to record what would be, Crim Crim well, what would be King Crimson's uh, final studio album, though they didn't know it at the time. Uh, however, I wouldn't say this is a trio album. This isn't a power trio uh, at its core. Well, I mean, at its core, I... <laughs> Sorry, at its core, it is a power trio, but it's far more than that on this album. Uh, it, fe it actually features the most amount of studio musicians since Islands, 
and uh, it includes former King Crimson Mel uh, it includes former King Crimson members uh, Mel Collins, Ian McDonald, and actually McDonald was in talks to rejoin the band officially, but unfortunately they broke out. They broke up before anything could really come of that, and he joined Foreigner instead. Freaking Foreigner of all bands. Uh, imagine going from King Crimson to Foreigner. I. I uh, imagine time traveling to King Crimson in 1974 and trying to explain Bible Black and JoJo. I mean, actually though, have you seen, uh, I think Robert Fripp, uh, he's acknowledged, uh, King Crimson and JoJo. Like, he made, uh, he made a post on Facebook some, some years ago referencing the meme, How Does King Crimson Work? Uh, so, Araki, at least, has been noticed. <laughs> um... But anyways, Red. Uh, what of the music of Red? This is the heaviest King Crimson album to date. It takes full advantage of the flying brick wall rhythm section to deliver this crushing, claustrophobic sound that's as captivating, I think, as it is uh, abrasive. Its sound would have this tremendous reaching influence. Uh, it influenced musicians of all stripes, not just progressive rock musicians, but other, like, grunge artists like Kurt Cobain. Kurt Cobain of Nirvana actually was really heavily inspired by Red for In Utero. Um, and uh, what helps the album along even more is that it doesn't meander. Uh, it's, it's actually structured similarly to In the Court of the Crimson King. It's got five songs in total, four of which are actual songs constructed in the studio. Uh, even the uh, one song that was taken live, the, uh, another, it's another improv song called Providence. It fits in well with this album, I think. It fits in well with the tone of the album. It's generally claustrophobic and crushing, too. Uh, it begins with this frightening conversation between violin and bass before eventually developing into this heavy jam between, uh, the flying brick wall and Fripp's, like, dissonant guitar feedback and all that. It's, it's a really interesting live performance, I think. Um, and as for the songs themselves, they're some of the best King Crimson has ever written, in my opinion. <laughs> uh, off topic, but since we mentioned them, Heart-Shaped <laughs> Heart Box Slaps. Oh yeah, I, I love, uh, I love my, uh, I love me and my Nirvana too. Um, I'm more of a Bleach and In Utero fan than a Nevermind fan. Uh, but I'll probably talk about that a lot more when we talk about, uh, the Nirvana discography on this channel. I'm not sure if that's gonna be, like, uh, an album-by-album -album review or a track-by-track -track review just because they haven't done so many albums. But, you know, I'd still love to cover Nirvana on this channel eventually. Uh, anyways, getting back to King Crimson. Um, uh, the songs on Red, yeah, some of the best that King Crimson has ever written. Uh, Red is this menacing instrumental. It's the, the title track of the album is this menacing instrumental built around a series of dissonant guitar riffs. It's got like a chugging uh, rhythm section. Uh, it's tagging along at a sludgy pace. This is, this sounds very Sabbath-y. It wouldn't sound out of place on a Black Sabbath album. It's killer, but it also doesn't lose the same trademark King Crimson complexity of before. It's probably the King Crimson album, uh, the King Crimson song, sorry, that you're most likely to headbang to. Uh, so yeah, if you like heavy metal, this is probably the King Crimson album for you. Um, Fallen Angel, it's this haunting ballad about gang violence in the, in the streets of Me in New York City. I love how it alternates between menacing bits like the opening guitar swell and the arpeggi riff sections with Mark Cherry once again returning on a cornet, uh, to beautiful moments like the sweet acoustic verses and an open oboe melody in the final verse. It's the uh, perfect balance between heavy King Crimson and their, mo and their more tender moments from their earlier albums. And it's all in a compact six minutes, which, believe it or not, is the uh, shortest run time on the album. Uh, One More Red Nightmare is a song about having this nightmare of a plane crash, and it's appropriately chaotic. Bill, Bill Bruford has this, uh, he, he, he gives this... Uh, how to say, it's, it's a very cool rock beat, and he has a bunch of fills. He plays this ruined crash cymbal that sounds like scrap falling out of the sky. Um, 
and it's combined with these discordant riffs of Wetton and Fripp, and it really sells the atmosphere of being trapped in a falling aircraft. And the solo sections, oh my god. Uh, Ian McDonald takes these two sax solos, and they are immaculate, especially the second sax solo, where he's essentially trading off and dueling with uh, Bill Bruford's fills. It's, it's really cool, and it makes you wonder what would have happened with King Crimson if Ian McDonald had actually stuck around and King Crimson had, uh, had remained for like a few more years in the 70s. Um, but, but, that all being said, we have yet to talk about the highlight of this album, and probably, in my opinion, the greatest King Crimson song ever made. Uh, that is Starless. It starts, a, it starts as this lovely ballad featuring a lyrical guitar melody from Robert Fripp, before transitioning into this unsettling middle section, which continually builds into a nightmarish cacophony full of drum fills, thundering bass, hair-raising repeated guitar notes, and suddenly, this song bursts into a new life with sax solos from McDonald and Mel Collins, and the, fry, and the flying brick wall keeps on racing to the finish, and they repeat the, the melodies from the intro, and it... <sighs> Just such a masterpiece of a song. It's probably the best 12 minutes and 30 seconds uh, of music you'll ever hear in your life. Um, do listen to it if you get the chance. Um, I can't give this album anything other than an S. I'm sorry, it's just, it's my favorite King Crimson album, and you can still fear, you can still feel the weight and the impact of this album almost, uh, almost 50 years after its release. Yeah, geez, in three years this album is going to be 50 years old. Can you believe it? That's, that's fucking insane. Um, so, where do we go from here? As I mentioned, uh, after Red, King Crimson broke up for the first time, and Fripp was in a bit of a proverbial wilderness for the next few years. He explored his spirituality a bit more. He also collabed with a bunch of art rockers like Brian Eno, David Bowie, Peter Gabriel, and the Talking Heads. Uh, and he also had a bit of a solo career too, and a little... I think, it was, I think it's a new year, uh, a new wave band um, called The League of Gentlemen. I don't know. I haven't, I, I haven't exactly dug into Robert Fripp's solo stuff. Um, maybe that'll be for another time. Uh, but eventually, Robert Fripp uh, formed a new band with Bruford in 1980, and he brought on board guitarist Adrian Ballou and bassist Tony Levin. Um, so, hold on a second. Starless Stan confirmed. Yes, I am. Uh, I am. Uh, I am a Stan. We stand Starless in this household. Period. Um. So yeah, uh, like I said, uh, Fripp formed this band. He brought back Bruford, but he also brought on Adrian Blue and Tony Levin. Uh, if you don't know who Tony Levin is, Tony Levin is. He's pretty much uh, one of the most underrated bassists of all time. He's played for a bunch of progressive rock bands, including Peter Gabriel. He was the bassist on Sledgehammer. Um, and Adrian Blue, I mean, I'm gonna gush about him a bit later, so uh, we'll save him for later. Um, so this band, uh, this new band toured for a bit as, uh, Discipline, before Fripp decided that they were a, um, before Fripp decided that they were essentially a new, um, incarnation of King Crimson. Uh, Bessie was staring right into my soul there. Yeah, I'm, sorry, it's, uh, I'm getting, I'm still getting a bit used to this model and how it's rigged in my webcam. <laughs> Um, what else? So yeah, um, this was a new incarnation of King Crimson, and um, what we got was this album, also called Discipline. Um, uh, so if this album, how, how to describe Discipline, it presents a new King Crimson sound. It's reconfigured for the 1980s, where prog rock had let's say, declined, to put it charitably. It's, uh, all the other bands at this time, Genesis, yes, um, they were veering in a more commercial direction, trying to, uh, I guess, capture the new MTV pop music market, and 
Not that all of the music from that period was bad or anything, but it's not what I love in progressive rock. Um, but um, this album, this new King Crimson incarnation, um, yeah, you keep turning to face the walls of their witch style. Ah, uh, jeez. So startled. I'm, I'm so startled. Um, but this new sound, this new King Crimson sound, it's actually a bit of a midway between progressive rock and new wave music, uh, especially because you've got Adrian Ballou, who uh, actually played with the Talking Heads. He toured with them from 1980 to 1981 on the Remain in Light tour, and their influence is felt in both his rhythm rhythmic guitar work and David, his David Byrne-esque voice. Uh, Ballou was actually the first, second guitarist in the band. Uh, Fripp wanted to try what he called a rock gamelan with interlocking guitar parts. Uh, if you've ever heard of gamelan music uh, from Indonesia, you might know what I'm talking about. But essentially it's this like textured, very layered music with a bunch of like melodies being played in different configurations at once. And this is a, this sort of effect is displayed several times spectacularly throughout Discipline, like frame by frame, and uh, the delicately ba balanced title track instrumental, which, like all the di all the band members are playing in different time signatures, and yet they sound perfectly in tune. It's crazy stuff. Um, as you might guess from the above, uh, they're they're uh, you know talking about gamelons and all that. Um, there's more of a world music influence on this album. Uh, uh, well, be punk now. Prong, prog is too long and outdated. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, por qué no los dos though? You also had bands in the '80s like the Cardiacs trying to combine the sounds. Uh, why can't we be friends? Um, but yeah, as I was saying, there's more of a world in music influence on discipline, most notably in this uh, serene instrumental called "The Sheltering Sky." Uh, it sounds it sounds like a cross between like a peaceful day at the beach and uh, I don't know it's it's this really it's this really uh, very atmospheric ch uh, track and then you got Fela Hungunji which is which is this very driving song with a pounding heavy uh, a tom heavy beat um, I remember learning a little about gamelan in music class but that was a long time ago yeah. I actually, uh, I, I took a world music class too, and for a, uh, for a little project, I think it, we had a, uh, what was it, an end of semester paper, a research paper, like we had to do um, some crazy amount of pages, like 20 pages, and uh, I remember doing uh, my, that paper on gamelan music. I, I, I don't think I did the do genre the most do justice, if I'm being honest. I probably BSed a lot of that essay, but... It's really interesting. Gamelan music is really interesting, and I'd love to, uh, I guess, learn a bit more about it. Um, but also, uh, to, to go back to discipline, uh, with Tony Levin in the band, um, King Crimson incorporated the Chapman stick for the first time, which was an instrument that uh, Tony Levin played. What is the Chapman stick? Uh, uh, blah. <laughs> What is the Chapman stick, I hear you might be asking? Well, it is essentially a tap bass. Um, you know, you can play you can play bass melodies on it, you know, by tapping the strings, but I think you can also do some guitar-ish sounds too. It's um the sound is really interesting. Like you can hear it especially on this album on the track Elephant Talk, which is it's it's deployed really well, almost like a slap bass, kind of like a, in a Red Hot Chili Pepper song. It's a Elephant Talk is a really funky track, and I like it a lot. And now, uh, now we've reached our uh, Adrian Ballou gushing hour. Uh, in my opinion, Adrian Ballou, uh, he he makes this album and this incarnate. He he's really good in like the the following incarnations in King Crimson. Um, he was by far King Crimson's most charismatic frontman. You know, he played guitar and he sang. He was, a, he was a very inventive lyricist, too, and probably the only other guitarist in the world, one of the only other guitarists, to rival Fripp in terms of weird guitar experimentation. He, if you've never heard him play guitar, uh, look up, after this stream, go look up David Bowie, live 1978, Station to Station. There's a live performance of Adrian Ballou, like, 
Right, there's a live performance of Station to Station from Tokyo or, or Nagoya, somewhere in Japan in 1978, where Adrian Ballou just goes utterly ham on, the, on guitar in the intro. He replicates a freaking train whistle. He does all this tapping and, and guitar feedback. And it's just like the coolest. When I first heard that as a David Bowie fan, it completely altered my perception of what guitar, what guitar playing could be. And you know, that's not the only weird stuff he's done. Like he actually made an album in the 90s, I think, where he basically made like an orchestra, an orchestral music, but all the instruments were played by played on guitar. <laughs> that that's that's. Uh, that's just to give you an idea of how, uh, how, how out there and how, uh, I guess, forward marching this guy was as a guitarist. Um, he, um, he mimics animal sounds a lot. Uh, if you, you hear him on this album, uh, I googled, is it the Budokan performance? Yes, I think so, yeah. Uh, whichever one is like 13 minutes. Um, uh, but as I was saying, yeah, he he likes to imitate sounds on his guitars a lot, especially like a animal sounds. Like on Elephant Talk, he plays like the sound effects, uh, like almost like an elephant uh, trunk, um, elephant line. Then uh, on the track Mate Kudasai, uh, which is this beautiful ballad, um, he plays the noises of a seagull on this uh, on top of this very um, like beach-like sounding accompaniment. Um, and he also sells, like, a lot of the... Like I said, he's, he's a pretty inventive lyricist. There are a lot of <laughs> weird lyrics, let's say, in the uh, in Baloo's tenure in the band. But he sells them with his very uh, quirky voice. Like, he sells them. He's got a really interesting, like I said, David Byrne-esque delivery. Um, but not most notably... Uh, that it's most notably shown on the track Indiscipline, which in my opinion is the standout track of the album. Uh, it alternates between these sections where Baloo and Fripp are trading off these chaotic feedback laden solos in between these uh, quiet, tense narration sections where uh, Baloo is talking about like the statue that his wife acquired or something and he delivers it in the most creepy, uh, tense way you could possibly imagine. Um, and meanwhile, Bill Bruford is just going frickin' ham on the drums. Like, I think I, I think I heard somewhere that, uh, Robert Fripp on a dare told Bill Bruford to record most of this album without actual, um, like, crash cymbals or ride cymbals or anything like that. Except for this song, where he could go basically as ham as he wanted, and, oh god, he, he delivers. He definitely delivers. Um, what else? Um, so yeah, I think that's, uh, that's pretty much all to say about Discipline. Um, I, I really like it. It was a very solid start to, um, the Rock Game Along lineup in the 80s. Um, but compared to other Stellar King Crimson albums, it's, it's missing more textures, in my opinion. You know, for as much, for as much as, uh, what was I going to say? For as much as the band can do with two guitars, um, I feel, I personally prefer the, like, the several more classical jazz tinged textures of Red, of Islands, of In the Court of the Crimson King. You know, I wish, I wish there were more saxophones. I wish there was, uh, I wish there was a violin part. God, I even... I even kind of wish there was a keyboard or two from like from the, from Lizard. Just just something a bit more a bit more variety than just uh, rock gamelon. Um. So, the new band, this new band, who who was hot off the success of uh, Discipline, they would go on to make this album beat. Um, they were su they were a success. This new band and they hit the road touring. But when they started planning for this new album, this beat, um, they found themselves in a bit of a pickle once more. They they hadn't developed much in the new in the way of new material again. In fact, Blue was kind of struggling uh, to to write songs for the Rock Gamelon configuration. Uh, so 
The band entered the studio, they wrote, they bickered with each other, they nearly broke up, and we got beat out of it. Oh boy, this album, where, where do I begin? This, just to get it out of the way first, this is not a bad album. Uh, it's just a bad King Crimson album. The bounce between New Wave and Frog Rock on this album, uh, which was, it was more even on discipline, but it shifted so far in the direction of a uh, New Wave at this point that there's not much distinguishing it from other New Wave acts at the time. Uh, you know, Talking Heads especially comes to mind. Um, but this album is heavily inspired. It's, it's, it's inspired by beat culture of the 1950s. Um, you've got titles like Neil and Jack and Me, Sartori and Tangiers, Heartbeat, but unfortunately the influence doesn't extend much beyond the titles or the lyrics. Uh, it doesn't exactly have that avant-garde or cutting up uh, or cutting edge uh, attitude that the beat generation had. Um, Instead, I would argue, it's mostly Crimson playing it safe. Yeah, you've got Heartbeat and Two Hands, which are the most uh, obvious culprits, but a lot of the other songs in the album just lack that drive and edge that made Discipline so compelling. Even if there are some pretty neat textures being laid down on the guitar bass, the, chap and the guitar, the bass, the Chapman stick, um, you know, especially uh, Waiting Man and Sartori and Tangiers, they got some pretty interesting grooves going on, but I don't know, it's, it, it's, not, really, uh, it's not really the same. Um, nearly breaking up is a prog band tradition. God, you're goddamn right, and uh, salvaging the chaos out of it. Um, what do we see? Uh, so to talk about some positives of beat for a moment, um, Neurotica, that is a highlight. I, I actually kind of, I like Neurotica. Uh, it's got Baloo sp sp spouting off these uh, rapid fire radio narrations uh, over top this driving jazz fusion instrumental. It's the piece, I'd argue, with the most connection to Crim Crimson's previous trailblazing. It's got plenty of crazy time signature manipulations, dissonant guitar notes, um, yet more insane drumming from Bill Bruford. Really cool stuff. Um, but the ending track, Requiem, it's also neat. Um, that said, uh, oh, sorry, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. Requiem's neat. It's got, like, Blue Bruford uh, improvising over a murmur, from a murmur to a pain roar over top this, uh, it's essentially a tape loop that Robert Fripp put together. It's called Frippertronics. I, I couldn't explain it, I couldn't explain to you how he does it uh, to save my life, but it's essentially a tape loop. Um, but, uh, this track, uh, fun fact, it actually, this was the one that almost directly led to the breakup of the band because, you know, they were having such a hard time getting it together and they were, uh, in, they were, uh, how to say, improvising and, I don't know, I, I guess they just sort of snapped and Adrian Ballou at one point ordered Robert Fripp out of the studio and Fripp, he, he complied, but he was, he pretty much, uh, I don't know, King Crimson pretty much almost broke up then and there, and it took a bit of cajoling to get them to go on tour in support of the album. Uh, so yeah, uh, Requiem, you know, it has a bit of a stormy history. It does, it is a pretty good sounding track, and it's probably the most serious attempt to break the limitations of their new sound, but it's unfortunately too little too late. Then Kyle Mankin, which album smells the best? Ooh, that is a, that is a good question. Um, I don't know, I'd, uh, I'd imagine Islands has a pretty nice smell to it, you know. Maybe a bit of salty sea, maybe some pastoral flowers. Um, I can tell you what's the worst smelling King Crimson album, though. Construction of light, but oh god, oh god, we we'll we'll get we'll get to construction of light. Believe me, we'll get to construction of light. Uh, what working with Robert Fripp sounds like a nightmare at times. Oh yeah, no, uh, 
Uh, Bill Bruford has described him as one part uh, Marquis de Sade, one part Joseph Stalin, one part Mahatma Gandhi. And uh, Gordon Haskell, who I mentioned was the bassist and singer on their third album, Lizard, uh, would later go on to describe King Crimson as musical fascism. So, uh, Fripp has not exactly had the best working relationship with his bandmates in the past, but he seems to be a bit more chill now. Um, anyways, as I was saying, <laughs> uh, Islands is an S to your sense. Um, but as I was saying, beat, uh, beat, it gets a D. And, um, like I said, not a bad album. It's not bad music. But if I want to recommend a King Crimson album to somebody, I think beat would be far from the top, just because King Crimson are capable of so much more. Um, but after beat, though, King Crimson, they still, they still kept trucking. Uh, they embarked on another live tour before trying again to recapture what made Discipline work in the studio. This time, the process was a bit more difficult and strained, if you can believe it. There was a lot more... There was actually, I think, a whole compilation album there of just discarded ideas for this album. Uh, <laughs> Robert Fribb, you know, randomly put that out on the band's website once. Um, but what we eventually got was, it was something of a compromise in Three of a Perfect Pair. Is this a JoJo reference? Um, yes, King Crimson's prolonged 50 year existence was a JoJo reference. Congratulations, Zero Two, you have cracked the code. I'm just kidding, welcome man, hello. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, the process, yeah, like I said, it was, in the end, uh, Three of a Perfect Pair ended up being a bit of a compromise. Um, what was that compromise, though? Um, well, Side A, it consisted of more commercial, easy to listen to songs, while Side B consisted of more experimental, mostly instrumental pieces. You have the accessible and the excessive, uh, respectfully, as Robert Fripp said at the time. Uh, perfectly balanced, as one, as all things should be. Um, but how does this play out in practice? Well, it's actually pretty decent, I'd say. Uh, the commercial tracks on Side A are probably some of the best that Kit Blue's ever written. Uh, <laughs> well, yay, good luck on the ranking. Thank you. Uh, all of Prodbrook was made, was just made up by a Rocky. What a genius. Yes, yes indeed. Uh, it's made by Araki and uh, Nobuo e Uematsu of Final Fantasy. Uh, what else? Yeah, as I was saying, Side A, it's uh, some of the best tracks that Blue's written. Uh, it's got this wonderful, uh, it wonderfully fuses the interlocking guitars and the weird, weird time signatures of Discipline with some of the pop sensibility found on the beat. Uh, the title track is a wonderful example of this. Uh, it's just those harmonies, man. If you've never, if you've never listened to uh, Three of a Perfect Pair of the Song, uh, do listen to it. It is so catchy, and there's a. There's a, there's a funny meme out there uh, called Prog Cats, uh, P-R-O-G-C-A-T-S, look that up on YouTube, it's funny, I love it. Um, <laughs> um, but also, there's a Man With an Open Heart and Model Man, which are also really uh, catchy songs, but with a bit of a times, uh, you know, changing time signature edge to it. Um, there's also Sleepless, oh my god, that bass. Um, and the drums are also funky as hell, but the guitars, the synths, and Baloo's vocals and lyrics over top, they, they create this sort of haunting, you know, dancey, atmospheric atmosphere. It's, <laughs> atmospheric atmosphere. Wow, Rissy. Um, it's really nice, though. S uh, side A is great all around. Uh, side B is a bit more of a cerebral listen. Uh, the ominous industry is really cool. It sort of sounds like a precursor to the more atmospheric video game music of the 1990s. Excuse me. We've also got uh, Dig Me, which is a bizarre track with more quirky, speak-singy vocals from Blue a la Indiscipline or Neurotica. 
you know, one of those tracks. And the closing track is a continuation of the Lark's Tongue and Aspic Suite. It's Lark's Tongue and Aspic Part 3. Um, it's, it's great in its own right, but as with all trilogies, it sort of pales in comparison to the first truth, for the first two songs. Uh, the first half of part three, it, brilliant update, it brilliantly updates the melody from the first two parts of the, of the suite at a faster, more frantic pace before it sort of slows down, mellows out into an extended track, as an extended jam for the rest of the song, which in my opinion goes on a bit too long. Aren't you yourself a frog cat? Why yes, I am. Thank you for noticing. Um, what else? Uh, yeah, no, uh, part three of the large tongue and aspect suite, I personally think it goes on a bit too long. Uh, if there was more of that first part, I'd love this piece a lot more. But in all, I think that this is a definitely, be I think this album is definitely leagues better than B. Uh, still though, there are some moments that drag it down. No Warning and Nuage, uh, they're decent atmospheric tracks, but they're not much notable beyond that. I feel comfortable putting this album in the B tier. Uh, and I think with that, uh, give me one second. I think... I'm going to be right back real quick. I'm going to get a drink of water, and then we're going to continue with more King Crimson album rankings. I will be right back. Returned. <laughs> yes, the, uh, the Blair Witch has got me. There is no Resi, only Zul. Sorry, I'm mixing up my references here. Let's continue. Uh, so, after Three of a Perfect Pair, at this point, Thrip was fed up again. Uh, he, he dissolved the ban, and uh, it's kind of funny because at the time, what was it? Um, I think it was uh, Baloo and Groofer, they didn't even know the band had broken up until they saw it in the papers. Or at least Baloo, I know. Uh, Fripp wasn't, <laughs> you know, he's never been the best at communicating with his bandmates. <laughs> uh, over the next decade, he would focus on teaching students his own unique way of guitar playing through a set of courses called Guitar Craft, and he would form his own label, Discipline Global Mobile, to break away from the music industry and sort of create his own isolated, I guess, King Crimson, Robert Fripp, crafty guitarist universe, uh, extended uh, musical universe, TM. Um, meanwhile, uh, Tony Levin would go back to working with Peter Gabriel. As I mentioned, he was the bassist on Sledgehammer, but he also played bass on, you know, the rest of So and... So you've, pro you've probably heard Tony Levin's uh, bass playing in some form or another. Um, Blue continued his own solo career, and he also got to tour with David Bowie again in 1990. Um, Bill Bruford, he would temporarily uh, join, rejoin Yes, which is a hilarious sequence of events in and of itself, but that's for another video. Uh, eventually, with DGM, now Fripp's musical playground, though, he, he decided to reform King Crimson in 1994, with the 1980s lineup making a return in addition to new members. Uh, they, had, they had a new drummer, Pas Pat Mastoletto, uh, or Mastolato, Mastolato, yes, that's the way. <laughs> 
and there and then war guitarist and frip people Trey Gunn. And uh, you might be thinking to yourself, what is a war guitar? Well, it's kind of like a Chapman stick. <laughs> It's, it's kind of like a Chapman stick. It's essentially a tap bass with uh, a bunch of uh, strings added to it, so you can also play like guitar uh, melodies on it too. It's, it's basically like a fancy craft guitar that I think only like a set, select few musicians have ever like seriously used in music. Tony Gunn being one of them. So, what to make of this uh, trio? Um, they would tour, uh, they would go on a tour and record under a double trio configuration. Uh, sorry, this isn't a trio, this is a double trio. <laughs> and if you listen to a live concert from around this era, I think between 1994 and 1996, this band was on the road, uh, you can get an idea for this absolutely massive mammoth sound that they could create. So what to make of this lineup's only studio album, which is, um, hold on a sec. This album here, 1995's Thrack. Well, how to say. The first talk about its sound, it feels like the band was responding to the environment around them. Uh, as they returned to the heavy crunch of free improv King Crimson, uh, I think, in response to prog metal's rising popularity and maybe some, like, of the heavier alternative grunge stuff, too. But they also still kept a foot in the interwoven guitars of the 1980s incarnation. So you had a bit of, uh, old, you had a bit of 70s, you had a bit of 80s combined into this 90s incarnation. Um, the sound... It's something to behold, honestly, especially when Mastelotto and Bruford are playing off of each other. You'll hear that on songs like Dinosaur, People, and Sex, Sleep, Eat, Drink, Dream. They're all particularly striking in this regard. Uh, and Baloo on these tracks, he's, he's still just as good a singer as, as he was in the uh, 1980s King Crimson incarnation. In fact, he freaking howls his guts out on some of these tracks. Definitely some of his better vocal deliveries in King Crimson's uh, history. Um, there are even some nice softer moments on Thrak. Uh, the rest, uh, well, wait, no, sorry. Uh, it's got like these two uh, tracks called Inner Garden, which are very atmospheric and haunting. You've got Walking on Air, which, for my money, is the most beautiful ballad Baloo's ever written. And then, One Time. Uh, it's, it's also a decent soft track, but I think that the double trio is underutilized here. Definitely could have put a bit more texture in here. Um, all that being said, I only just talked about the vocal tracks of this album, and that is all of the vocal tracks on the album. Um, the rest consists of instrumentals with largely onomatopoeic names like Baboom, Vroom, 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 and uh, they're fine, but largely unmemorable. It comes off to me as retread ground from Red. Uh, hell, one of the instrumentals even actually uses a uh, guitar part originally written for Red. And to make matters worse, this was when CDs were all the rage, and bands packed them full of songs, regardless of if the album was well paced or not. This album, it goes on for almost an hour, and god does it really feel like that in places. Overall, uh, Thrak is a decent album. Uh, there, are, there are definitely some tracks here worth listening to, but it's... Uh, I probably need to revisit this a few times before I could, you know, really get into the instrumentals. So, I'm placing it in C. And then... So after this double trio, uh, they had, the, you know, the huge, massive tour. Um, I'm looking forward to the... Hold on a second. Looking forward to when King Crimson makes a song called Skrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
Yeah, man, you actually joke, but I think, uh, I think artists are actually applying that same freaking logic to, uh, album releases on Spotify. It's, it's kind of exhausting. A lot of pop albums nowadays are regularly going over an hour, and I'm like, spare us the filler, just give us the killer, you know? Man. So as I was saying, after uh, the Double Trio had this huge, massive tour, they hunkered down in Nashville, uh, I think it was Nashville anyway, some rehearsal space for like a week or so, and they started developing new material, but things didn't really go anywhere, and people uh, and the band members were largely dissatisfied, especially Bill Bruford, who actually low-key quit, yes, like right after these rehearsals. Uh, no, not yes, King Crimson. I'm getting my Bill Bruford bands confused. <laughs> um, but, yeah, like I was saying, these rehearsals were fruitless, so instead what King Crimson did was they uh, split off into a bunch of individual projects, as they were called. That's spelled P-R-O-J-K-C-E-T-S, because I guess King Crimson and Poor Literacy are cool. Um, so these projects, um, you know, I won't cover them here because I feel like they're not King Crimson, King Crimson, but they, they're essentially the band, uh, the band members exploring various different sorts of sonic textures like jazz, other improvisational music, you know, spacey atmospheric sounds. Um, and during this time, uh, Bruford and Levin, like I mentioned, uh, Bruford left already, but Levin, he'd also go to focus on his uh, studio uh, musician playing. Uh, so that uh, that left the double trio as a, as Robert Fripp has officially called them, the double duo. And yes, I agree, that is, that is one of the stupidest sounding descriptions for a four-piece band you could ever, uh, you could ever say. But... Uh, moving on from that, uh, this remaining four would eventually hunker down in Baloo's personal studio in Nashville to record a new album, and, well... <sighs> he should have been workshopping ideas a little longer, I think. Uh, actually, they did admit, I think, later on that uh, the music on this new album that they sat to record wasn't rehearsed, really, before they went to go record it. So, what we got was this album called The Construction of Light. Uh, sorry. Uh, the Construction of Light, this album right here. And, what to say? Uh, well, I suppose I should start with the positives, right? We, we try to keep this a chill stream here. Um, the title track is decent, and the, uh, the vocal section of it calls to mind D Discipline Era King Crimson. And actually, it also introduces this new sound in the rock gamelon in the form of Hockett for the first time. If, if you don't know what Hockett is, it's this musical technique where two different voices essentially trade uh, notes in, an, in a melody, one after the other, and they sort of do the same he thing here with uh, Adrian Ballou and Robert Flip Fripp uh, bouncing between one another for the melodies on guitar. Um, it's a neat textural change, I think, and Fractured, uh, Fractured does this, it's a modern reimagining of the original Fracture from Starless and Bible Black. Except this time it makes the uh, implicit prog metal overtures a lot more explicit at this point. To, to great effect, I think. I also love the coda for... Hold on a second. Uh, Robert Fripp would call you a single, single veto. <sighs> Pain, Peckle. Um... I also, yeah, I also love the coda for, uh, they have another part uh, to the Lark's Tongues and Aspic Suite on this album, th which has a coda, which is really cool, called I Have a Dream. Uh, Baloo uh, is singing, he's listing off a bunch of 20th century atrocities that have happened, while the drums and the guitars, they collapse all around him. Keep in mind, 
this was happening, this album was released in uh, 2000, you know, when Y2K and all the anxieties of the new millennium were setting in. So I think this is a perfectly appropriate track to put on, like, an album that, put, that came out around then. Um, but... <sighs> okay. Let's rip up the band I Let's rip off the band-aid. Uh, this album sounds ugly as hell. Uh, Mastelato's uh, drum tracks, they're partly acoustic, they're partly electric, but they wholly sound like garbage. Compared to his work on Thrak, uh, there's some interesting little sonic ex experimentations on this album, I guess, and most, but... <sighs> yeah, most, I would say, are pretty annoying. Um, Prozac Blues is especially freaking heinous in this regard. Uh, it distorts and lowers Baloo's voice to make him sound like some sort of blues singer, uh, while the rest of the band, they play this janky backing track, and this is the lead-off song of the freaking album. This is literally the first impression the band gives you of their new sound. And... Unfortunately, it don't get much better from here. The other vocal tracks, um, Into the Frying Pan, it's a confusing mess of a song, which lacks the catchiness that most of the vocal tracks on Thrack did. And then you've got The World's My Oyster Soup, Kitchen, Wax Floor, Museum. Yes, that is the entire title of the song. It has an interesting groove, but at six minutes, it honestly wears out its welcome pretty quickly. Um, but by far the largest disappointment with this album, it's, uh, it's The Lark's Tongues in Aspic Part 4. Um, it's 13 minutes long, and you know, the, thir the first part was also 13 minutes long, but unlike that part, uh, this, this part is just heavy riff after heavy riff after heavy riff. There's no real tonal or dynamic shift to really catch your attention. Um, in, until the coda. In fact, that's something I would say about this album in general. It lacks a lot of the sonic, textural experimentation of past King Crimson. Um, it starts weird and heavy, and it ends weird and heavy, with one exception. The final track, Heaven and Earth, is this nice instrumental, blending ambient synth patterns, a driving rock section, before ending on this calming tide of synth and deep drums, if, if I'm being honest, it's probably the most King Crimson song on the album, and it's technically not even by King Crimson! It's by a project, the Project X to be specific, uh, which is, it's technically the same band, it's got Gun, Blue, uh, Mastelato, and Fripp, but they just called themselves Project X for some reason. So uh, they also they also recorded like another companion album around this time, which I haven't listened to. I don't know. It's probably more of the same with this track, but it's 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 just funny. Uh, you know, it's all in all, I think this album is King Crimson's worst. It's uh, it's King Crimson going through the motions, which is the which is the phrase that I don't think King Crimson should ever be associated with. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, D, oh, sorry again. Oh, here we are. D, 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 all around. It's so bad that it made me flustered enough where I messed up my OBS overlay. That's how bad it is. Um, but, after releasing that, it, it fortunately does go up a bit from here. Yeah, I know we only have like one more album to cover, but it does get better in the end, I assure you. Um, after releasing that specimen of an album that was Construction of Light, uh, King Crimson once again went on tour. They actually uh, supported Tool on their Lateralis tour. Imagine that, the masters of prog rock and prog metal opening for their modern torchbearers. It's, it's really a neat full circle mo moment. Um, but over the next few years of crimsoning, as Fripp would put it, the double duo grew more comfortable with one another, and they began coming into a new sound, which was teased in a few EPs from around this time. Um, I'm not really 
I wasn't really interested in covering any King Crimson EPs uh, for this tier ranking. I know they have some original songs that didn't actually make it to um, the albums, but uh, it's mostly just uh, album songs that were re-recorded later. Um, but anyways, the fruits of these albums came out in this album, The Power to Believe, which is their final studio, studio effort to date, released back in 2003, so it's been 17 years. Um, it's still a long album, The Power to Believe, but it's mercifully a few minutes shorter than the preceding two, and it actually has a much, much better flow than either. Uh, see, the band, it, they bring back the idea of the recurring sweet song back in, uh, in the wake of Poseidon in the form of The Power to Believe, which is a series of four tracks interspersed throughout the album. And with the exception of the first, uh, their songs with their own distinct sections and sonic experimentations, they're definitely a lot more developed than the piece suite, though uh, I would say that part two maybe goes on a bit too long. Uh, that's a bit of a nitpick, though. Uh, the instrumentals here are largely an improvement from construction uh, in the first place, because Mastelato is playing a great-sounding acoustic kit this time, and also because the band's a lot more dynamic and experimental in their textures. Um, this album no notably incorporates a lot of industrial beats and samples, uh, which works in some cases, particularly Level 5 and Electric, which are instrumentals that are so heavy and so clean that you think they were pulled off a factory assembly line. In other instances, like the record stretches on Happy With What You Have To Be Happy With, it comes off as <laughs> a bit corny and dated. Uh, speaking of happy with what you have to be happy with, which I'm going to be calling happy uh, for the rest of this video, because that is a mouthful of a title, the vocal songs on this album are a marginal improvement from the last. Uh, the haunting track, Eyes Wide Open, is a personal highlight of mine, in fact. Uh, in Facts of Life, it's a straight banger. Uh, happy, though, um, it's a bit too goofy of a song for me, in part because of the record scratches, but also in part because of Blue's meta lyrics about writing the song in the first place. I guess, I guess that's fun uh, if you're into that sort of thing, but, you know, meta humor I feel like is something that's best reserved for parody and not, not a serious King Crimson effort. I don't know, maybe I'm just, maybe I just got a bit of a stick in my ass. But anyways, that is the album, and it's overall fine. It shows the double duo in a more comfy position than before, but it's still a tiny bit of an exhausting listen due to its length and complexity. I'd say if you want to get into King Crimson, make your way to this album eventually. Uh, don't, don't sleep on it, for sure. But don't start off with it. It's a great Latter Day album. I would say that this album deserves a B. Uh, yeah. And that does it. That is all 13 King Crimson studio albums ranked. Uh, I've given all of my thoughts, so uh, if you would like to see them, if you'd like to hear them once again, I will probably, after this stream, uh, put in timestamps. I'll probably go through the uh, live stream and figure out when I talked about specific albums. I'll put the timestamps in the description, so if you want to hear my specific uh, opinion about any, go right ahead and click on the timestamps in the description. Uh, so, that is, this has been my first uh, music review. I hope you guys have enjoyed it. I, uh, I really had a bit of a fun time just going through it. I definitely need to, uh, I don't know, I feel like I need to settle on my groove a bit more in terms of speaking through all these albums, I definitely need more water. Like, maybe I should consider investing in the freaking water bottle. But I'd love to do more of these things. Just share uh, m my opinion of, like, all of these artist discographies, especially, like, I, I, I feel like under... Pr uh, not that King Crimson is, like, underappreciated, but I feel like they're, you know, 
there's a lot of people that misunderstand them and only know them from like anime references and whatnot. I'd love to do that sort of thing for a lot of bands and artists and sort of demystify them and provide an entryway into uh, you know people to get into them. So, you know, in the future, I might do bands like, you know, I've been thinking, yes, King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard, um, maybe David Bowie, that would be pretty cool eventually to do a David Bowie album to your ranking. Um, I don't know, maybe some Budgie, uh, I have a bunch of different I ideas for album reviews. Um, but yeah, no, um, <laughs> I did, yeah, no, I, I kind of did this to myself. Um, but I mean, uh, I guess that is the nature of a lot of really old bands that have left a significant impact. They've made a lot of music, and I, I do think that even if it is lengthy, it is worth it to go through and just sort of look at it each on their own and, like, I don't know, see how each album relates to the other. Um, so yeah, no, I'm, I'm really glad that however many people came to watch today, thank you once again for coming to watch. Um, I would, yeah, like I said, I'd love to do more streams like this in the future. Uh, by the time you finish speaking, King Gizzard will have released five albums. Yeah, you know, I was thinking of that, like, um, <laughs> when they're, uh, when they're, they, they recently put out, you know, like I said in my Minecraft stream, they recently put out a new album, like, days ago, and <laughs> I was like, Oh boy, that, that just gives me more work on the future King Gizzard video, but, you know, we'll see exactly how far behind, how much I need to play catch, catch up by the time I get to them. <laughs> Anyways, thank you all so much for coming. Um, my next stream is going to be on Friday at 3pm. I will be starting a playthrough of Binding of Isaac. Really looking forward to that game. Like I said, you know, I like my roguelikes. I like uh, Metroidvanias. Um, I really like that it's sort of uh, inspired by Zelda 1 dungeon design. Um, so yeah, really, really look forward to that. I think it's going to be a fun series. You might see me rage a lot. Probably a lot of funny, uh, funny jokes. <laughs> I don't know. Come see me on Friday. I would, I would love to see, uh, I'd love to see you guys there. Thank you again so much for tuning in. This has been Rezi Orenji bringing you my first music review, and I will see you all next time. Bye bye.